Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. So let's get started with the ninth lecture. We are almost ending uh, the Dark Matter School 2023 Natal. So if you're watching this video for the first time, take a look at the previous lectures, okay? And these lectures are meant for advanced students. So let me share my slides. And again, uh, again, I remind you that the in next year, 2024, around July, we're going to have the Dark Matter Neutrino Workshop and School at ICTP Safer in Sao Paulo. And uh, we'll have lectures on Dark Matter as well, but we're going to have three lectures only on Dark Matter. So obviously, uh, for obvious, obvious reasons, we won't go into details. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be one of the lecturers. Uh, this lecture is supposed to given, be given by uh, Stefania Gori. Well, if she accepts the invitation. Okay, so let's get started. So can you all see, see my screen? Yes? Okay. So let me just recap what we saw in the last lecture. Uh, we discussed indirect detection, and I will not discuss this again. Slow down, come on. It's slow. Okay, in the eighth lecture, we discussed the, we started discussing what gamma ray, in this case, gamma ray flux would look like from dark matter inhalation or decay. And just to remind you that we need, we always rely on three assumptions that the annihilation cross section is, is for non relativistic particles, okay? And first, and also like to emphasize that the sigma v we probe using indirect dark matter detection, such as gamma ray telescopes, is different from. It can be very, very different from the thermal inhalation cross section, which it is then relevant for the dark matter abundance. And we do rely on standard model physics. So we assume that the standard model processes are the ones that govern the gamma ray or cosmic ray production, which is not is not necessarily true. And also we obviously we assume that the dark matter and model particles uh, they interact with some sizable coupling, okay? Otherwise, we would not see any signal from dark matter whatsoever. Okay. And, okay, let me just recap here. We had the flux from dark matter annihilation. which would be proportional to the sigma v over m squared times some density squared integrated over the line of sight and some dn de, where dn de refers to the amount of photons produced per annihilation as a function of energy. Okay, and from decay, the only thing it does is so the flux from dark matter decay. The big change will be instead of being having the sigma v, just to remind you that this sigma v and m the m squared came from the fact that the annihilation had chi and chi meeting each other. So the flux would be proportional to n chi squared. In other words, to rho squared over m chi squared. But in this case, and this thing that matters is the interaction rate. The interaction rate for annihilation is the number density times sigma v. But as we had two dark matter particles, I got an, another n chi here. That's why I had n chi squared. In this case, I'll have the gamma, the interaction rate. But now instead of having just two n chi's, I'll have one n chi only. So I have one row 
in 1M in the denominator. Also, the integral should be on the line of sight. And also, I should calculate the... Hold on, let me close my WhatsApp because it'll be popping up messages the whole time. And D and D for gamma, where is the number of photons produced per decay of the dark matter particle? Okay, so now we're gonna go into the details of that. And I was trying to take a look. I was talking to Ion Vienna uh, yesterday, and and he told me that some of you guys are using Micromegas to compute the DND. And uh, I won't go into the details of that, but I think it's not the the best, uh, the most, I'll say, precise way to compute the energy spectrum. Micromegas does not do a very good job using uh, to compute the ND. Anyways, but I haven't checked the latest version of Micromegas. Maybe they have improved it. The, the way they compute the ND, the energy spectrum from dark matter annihilation. But I did check once that depending on the amount you have, the difference you can get is very, very large. So I'll say the best program to compute the ND is still Pythia. And there is a program which is better than Pythia for certain cases, which is the PPPC IDM from Marco Cirelli. And we're going to cover those today. Okay, so let me share the now the the paper from Cirelli, which is this one. The poor particle physics cookbook. I loved it because is he doesn't want to go into the weedy details of astrophysics. He just goes like, okay, if you are a particle physicist and you're trying to do some indirect dark matter detection, what's the minimal thing you need to know to get this thing done? Okay, that's that's the 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 idea, and I loved it. So first, uh, oh, hold on. So first, he he discussed the difference in the estimation of the energy spectrum using different Monte Carlo generations, Monte Carlo generators such as uh, Pythia and Hervic. I must say that Micromegas uses an uh, old version of Pythia. Okay, so you should be aware of that. It's not the latest version and does not include electroweak corrections. As I'm going to show you today, they are, can be very, very important. All right. And also, uh, Micromegas does not include inverse Compton scattering. So Micromegas is sort of limited, but okay, it serves to have a, a, a rough estimate for, for dark matter. Serves the purpose to have a rough estimate. So we had a first question. Comment? Oh, awesome. See, Luca is saying that now includes the electronic corrections. That's the, which version is this, Luca? It's version, uh, let me check, 5.3. Awesome, that's perfect. Okay, that's a huge change now. It's good to know. Okay, now you're gonna understand what's the importance of including electronic corrections. So let me skip some things here. Okay, now I want to discuss this thing. So the as you've noticed, the dark matter flux for annihilation depends on rho squared. For decay, we depend on the integral of rho. Rho being the density profile of dark matter. It's just saying how dark matter is distributed in a given astrophysical object. Okay? What's the density? And as you know, as you see here, the NFW profile, which is given by some constant, 1 over RRS, minus two what is what is doing here is then this r s here okay some constant i'm gonna call this a constant let's say whole s so what it's saying is r s is just one number they find from trying to solve the the 
the rotation curve of given galaxies. So what they notice is that the density profile scales as one of R when R is much smaller than RS. RS is some some value they, they pick for 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 a given galaxy. So each galaxy will have a different RS and each galaxy will have a different rho s. I mean here, this constant here, rho s. Again, what is rho s? Rho s is a constant which is normalized in such a way that the I know that the density of dark matter around the sun is h sun is today is 0.4 gv per centimeter cube so what i do is i integrate this and i need to know that this rho r when r equal rho sun should be equal to rho sun which is 0.4 so then i just pick r to be rho sun r to be rho sun and then i pick the values for rho s and rho and r s these two things i could have picked just one one constant i normalize these two things to guarantee that the rho this function here at the sum location gives me the correct value so this is just normalization constants normalized to the dark matter density at the sun's location that's more well measured okay so it's just normalized to something that i know well so all of them you're going to see they have constants all over you're going to see here they have this one has rho s rs rho s rs rho s rs and so on so they're all constants normalized to guarantee that the sun the density profile at the sun location is is the correct value okay all right <clears throat> so and the other thing I want to emphasize is that they have very different behaviors. The functions seem to be very, very different. But once you plot them as a function of distance, you won't see them being much different, as I'm going to show you today, soon enough. And where they get these functions from? They get from simulations, most of them. So they use those galaxy simulations that I showed you in the previous video, where they have these galaxies being formed, place a uh, density and say, okay, I put dark matter particles of the sun size, let the gravity flow, and then and then you get the map. And they can, I don't know how, from that video, they can extract what is the density profile of dark matter distributed in a galaxy. So it's a numerical input. And then they have different simulations, get different results, and that's why you have different row. But all of them at the sun should be this, give the 0.4 GV over centimeter cube value because that's measured, okay? Has nothing to do with numerical simulation, that's measured. Okay, so all of them have to be the same. And then they have to do with different co cosmological simulations. For instance, this one is the oldest one. It's NFW profile, Navarro Franklin and White profile. I must say that white used to be the uh, one of the uh, members of the International Committee of IIP here in Natal. White. So he was here, for instance, when I, I, well, I found out that he was in the committee when I was hired back then. Okay, maybe he liked the dark matter idea, right? Because it's from dark matter. All right, so... And ANASTO came afterwards, and you're going to see they are the most used ones for as far as dark matter in direct detection searches are concerned. They are the most used density profiles, NFW and ANASTO. And there is one which people are using more just as a con con contrast to what this NFW and ANASTO adopt is more a uh, Burkett profile which is more flat, you're going to see it. It is not as steep as the NFW and NASA profile. So these two, all those profiles at the end, they try to describe how dark matter distributed as you go from far from the center of the galaxy towards the center of the galaxy. 
what's the distribution of dark matter along this this distance okay r is the distance from the center of the galaxy to some distance whatever okay so the center is the center of the galaxy that's my orange center of the galaxy and here it is so in this case you have the density of dark matter as a function of r being kiloparsecs and let me zoom in a bit more so you have see the burkett profile is this one here is very core so is not does not lead to a density which is very large towards the center of the galaxy the center i have to move in the to the left the r is becoming small and small and small see as i decrease r i go towards the center and the burkett profile is sort of is a, called a core profile so the number of the density of dark matter towards the center is small and the NFW, which is the most often profile used uh, in all collaboration papers, is very steep. Look, the difference is very large, 10 to 4 orders of magnitude different from the Burkett profile. So why is this relevant? So let's go back here. Go back to the formula. So looking at this formula, remember this thing, the flux, I measure it. This thing I'll get from simulation, from Pythia, whatever, or from Micromegas. If Micromegas includes electric corrections, then I should use it too. And this one comes from astrophysics. But then you can just see from this equation that the larger the density, the more stringent is the constraint I get on sigma v. Because the larger is rho, the smaller should be sigma v to get the same flux. Right? As I increase rho, I have to decrease sigma v to get to compensate to get the measure the measure flux. Make sense? Therefore, when you place a limit on the dark matter annihilation cross section that limit is sensitive to the density profile you adopt in your uh in your in the derivation of your limit okay so if you use an fw profile or something steeper obviously your limit will be very strong okay so for many years what we have witnessed was people were using very steep dark matter density profile to be the best found on dark matter in the literature. They will use very steep profiles and my bound is the best. Everybody should use mine because mine is the most restrictive bound. You don't use his bound, his bound is weak. Mine is the strongest. Oh, uh, yeah, sure, it's the strongest, but you're using a profile which makes your, your cross section sigma v to be really small. And I'm saying this because you are all particle physicists. But the particle physicists, usually they don't know about this. The only thing they understand is a bound sigma v versus mass. That's the only thing they know. They say, oh, for now, so this limit is excluded. Well, it's excluded depending on which profile. Okay? So then you call it, if you use an FW profile, you have been, let's say, optimistic in, the, in some sense, or a nasto you are being optimistic, but if you use different profiles, you you be more cons conservative in some way. So if you want to be more conservative, maybe you just say, OK, it's an FW, but this bound should not be taken at face value because we don't really know the density profile towards the center. We don't know. OK, that's a, that's a fact. And you, as you see, when people calculate the density profile, this integral here in rho squared, you go from r to zero until this line of sight. So I'm going to explain this now. 
So it's the following stuff. I'm the observer. I'm looking at a region of the sky. But I am the sun. I'm not at the center of the galaxy. I'm at the sun, right? However, I'm looking at an object there. But the R, this R in the density profile, is not the distance from me to the source. It's from the center of the galaxy to the source, R. It's from the center, OK? The frame is located at the center of the galaxy. Then what I should do, line of the, the law of cosines, I have one vector towards the source, one vector from the center to me, and another vector is from me to the source. OK? But as you see, when I integrate the whole dark matter density, is I integrate from the source until the center of the galaxy. But I don't know the density, the integral of the density of dark matter until the center of the galaxy. I don't know. So there is a large uncertainty in the j factor you get in the row you get, in the integral of row you get. Therefore, there's a large uncertainty in this bound on sigma v you get. OK? And here in the right is just the constants you can get to you get from for those different density profiles in order to make sure that the density at the sun location is the, the one we measured. OK, and just saying here this the distance from the sun. So this paper is sort of old. So in the sense that they use a node result for the density of the dark matter in the sun. They even say recent comp recent computations found a higher central value and possibly a smaller associated error still subject to debate. But this 0.3 GV centimeter cube now really merged. So this paper from 2010, is it? I believe this so. 2010, 2012. Uh, yes. From. Yeah, so it's around 2000, 2012. So from 2012, so from, since then we have uh, converged into a uh, dark matter local density of 0.4 GV per centimeter cube. Okay, now I want to discuss some things in the flux, which has to do with the energy spectrum. So in this code they have, they account for dark matter in relation to all leptons, okay? We, either if they're left or right, okay? They just sum them all. To quarks, gauge bosons, they sum them all, all the polarization states, to Higgs bosons, to neutrinos, and then they include, include these four, these three different channels. So let me try to explain now what this DND means. Let me go back there. Yeah. So the energy spectrum. Okay. So D and D is the number of photons produced per annihilation or per decay. So let's consider a case where you have dark matter, dark matter annihilating, producing gamma, gamma. In this case, I have two photons and that's it, right? And nothing else. Okay, so I have two photons and nothing else. Okay, fine. You're gonna see that the what I just said is not correct. And what you agreed on is also is wrong. So I can get more than two photons, but that's fine. So let me draw a Feynman diagram now. I have chi, chi bar, annihilates, let's say into Fermi, Fermi. Let's say plus and minus, and then you close the loop. Let me draw a Feynman diagram like this. Gamma, the Feynman diagram. I always forget if Feynman, if it's two ends or one end in the end. It's two ends? Just one. Yeah, just one? Okay. 
Yeah, but Boltzmann. Boltzmann. See? Five minus one. Five minus one. Yeah, he wanted to be different, yeah? Boltzmann. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's a proper name, so they wanted to pick a whatever. So I have a Kai Kai, let's say I have like this, Kai Kai, and is a fermion, annihilates, let's say through a Higgs boson, and then the Higgs couples to fermions, I close the loop of E, 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 let's say, and then I get a photon each light. Okay? So I can replace this E by any fermion. Okay? Massive fermion. Then in this case, you see, I have two photons. But I'm going to tell you that in the end, I won't have two photons. I'll have more. And that has to do with electric corrections. I'm going to discuss this later. OK, so the energy spectrum is just telling you how many photons you have for a given dark matter mass or for a given energy that those particles have. For instance, in this case, the energy of the gamma is equal to the mass of the dark matter particle. OK? Because by energy conservation, you have dark matter mass here. The energy is just a dark matter mass, basically. is at rest, let's say, or has a very small velocity. It just have the energy of the gamma, the energy of dark matter mass, is the dark matter mass. However, that's one case, gamma line. The second case is the continuum. Continue. It's like this. Chi chi goes into Fermi anti Fermi. And now let's pick it plus and minus again. Just to be certain. Say E minus E plus. And then this E goes here. It's an accelerated particle because it has an energy. And then it radiates a gamma. This one radiates a gamma, but it's not just one gamma, it's several gammas along the way. So, and then I ask you, how many gammas I have? Then I say, I don't know. Depends on the energy or the acceleration given by those particles into E plus E minus. Then now, instead of having one number or a delta function where the energy of the photons, the dark matter mass, I will have a distribution the number, the D and the E, the number of a lack of photons as a given energy, instead of being a delta, will be some function. I say like this. And this is the energy of the photon. Okay? And this energy of the photon should drop as it gets closer to the dark matter mass. Let's think of the following. Dark matter mass has one TV mass, one TV and m chi 1 tv is very hard remember i emit gammas several gammas the probability of one gamma have one tv energy is very small right because there are several gammas then one is special and you have just one tv for itself no so you'll be distributed so when the there is a we say there is a cutoff at the dark matter mass so the energy spectrum has a cutoff at the dark matter mass, okay? Because you cannot have a gamma larger than the dark matter mass. It's very unlikely. Make sense? Okay? All right, so this is a cutoff. Cutoff. Fine. And what the people usually do, they don't plot the N, D, over x, x being the energy of the photon, they plot something divided by the mass. So this is the energy divided by the mass of dark matter particle. And this is maximum 1. OK? And then the nd here. And then they plot again the same thing. OK? But the shape of this spectrum depends on what was produced in the final state. Why? OK, electrons produce radiation. But uh, maybe you don't know, 
but the amount of radiation particle emits is inversely, inversely proportional to its mass. If the particle is heavy, you will not irradiate loss of gammas. So light particles such as electrons will radiate loss of electrons. Mions, not as much. Tau, even less. Okay? But there is another thing that comes at the play that I'm going to discuss it now. So light particles produce radiation, or particles produce radiation inversely proportional to their masses. So light particles produce loss of radiation, heavy particles less radiation. Okay? This has to do with particle physics. It's not, it has nothing to do with like indirect dark matter detection. It's just particle physics. Pick, pick an electron and speed up the electron. You see you emit loss of gamma rays. Pick a muon, speed up the muon, you produce less gamma rays. That's why usually we, you consider E plus E minus accelerators instead of mu, mu plus mu minus accelerators, for instance, or tau plus tau minus accelerators. If you even forgot the decay, the lifetime of those particles, it's, it's easier to accelerate light particles than heavier particles, and these light particles will radiate more energy than the heavy ones. And also, there is the decay. For instance, we are currently discussing the existence of a mu mu collider. There is one trade off. Okay, you say, oh, look, we're not going to lose much energy because mu's are heavy, right? much heavier than the electron. <laughs> so it's good because we don't lose the energy of the incoming particle. However, muons decay. For lifetime, I believe it's 10 to minus 6 seconds. So it will decay. So it's for them to travel a long distance, they'll have decayed already. So in order to have a muon with a, to have a very long tunnel, to, to run a long tunnel, we'll have decayed already. So it's tricky to have a mu mu collider because many of them have decayed by the time they they give a, a whole turn. But okay, let's set aside this accelerated stuff. So you have chi chi bar in relation to plus and minus. Those E's will produce loss of gamma rays by acceleration. Okay, you learn this in a, in a course of electromagnetism too that accelerated particles emit gamma rays. Not gamma rays, emit gammas. To be gamma rays has to be at a given energy. And it's radiation. Okay, if we were taus, m chi, muons, let's say. And then you have m chi, m chi bar, 1 TV, 1 TV and produce mu plus, mu minus, mu plus. And that mu, that mu there, what it will do is, sure, you emit some gammas, not as much, but the mu decays into an electron, and then W, sorry, neutrino muon, W, electron, and antineutrino. So instead of writing like this, a Feynman diagram, I will just convert this into fermions. I'll get muon, electron, electron neutrino. Okay? So muons will produce electrons, right? But as you see, the energy of those electrons are smaller than if dark matter had annihilated only into electrons in the first place, right? So they lost, they have less energy. If dark matter annihilated to just E plus E minus, they have one energy, which is the dark matter mass. And now they had dark matter, dark matter annihilated to mu, 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 mu plus mu minus. They, okay, lost a bit of radiation into radiation, and then they decayed into electron plus two other particles. So the energy that these electrons have is smaller than the dark matter mass. If I had just dark matter, dark matter in relation to E plus E minus, the energy of E, E, E plus is the dark matter mass because the two by two 
process, right? So these electrons here have an energy which is smaller than the m chi. So you expect to see less gamma rays. This depends on, in, on energy, okay? It's an energy dependent conclusion. But you expect less gamma rays for muons than for a plus and minus. Mm -hmm. Yes, because of their masses. So he's asking if I accelerate to E plus an electron in a mu minus at the same rate, at the same with the same acceleration, or, or give them the same energy, when you produce a different amount of gammas than the other. Okay, but but notice this is a function of energy. So as you see here, what you see is the following. So I produced Chi chi bar e plus e minus. Okay? Each the E and E plus they have the dark matter mass in energy, right? So they will produce gammas, right? Fine. The energy of those photons will have high energy, right? Let's say if the, remember the the an electron has a dark matter mass in energy. So it produce gammas. The gammas they will produce will be energies which will be fractions of the dark matter mass. Now think of the, the, the case in the bottom. Chi chi bar, E plus, E minus. E plus, E minus, then and decays into an electron. Right? So the gammas they will produce will have less energy. Make sense? Compar in, in, relative, uh, in comparison with the first case? It doesn't mean that the total amount of gammas I see will be different. It will be different, but it depends on the energy. Let's think of the following. So in this case, I just told you, it makes sense that the energies from the first case will have large energies, but the gammas from the bottom case will have less energy. So at low energies, I expect to see many events for E plus E minus final state, then for mu plus mu minus, final state. For photons of low energy, I will appear low energy, low energy photons will appear more in the bottom and in the upper one, upper one, in the bottom. And for high energies, the opposite. You see? So if I had to compare, if I needed to compare the DND for dark matter going to E plus E minus or mu plus mu minus, I would know that at low energies, this here, this for this function here, around here, the muon should be around there, and the e plus e minus should be on the top. Right? Make sense? It doesn't mean that. And now you then you, then you think of the following. Then it's a function. So as I increase the energy of the photons, which is this one. As I'm increasing the energy of the photons, as I'm increasing, increasing the energy of the photons, what it means? It means that many of these photons have close to the dark matter mass in energy, right? And then you have to now think, okay, how, how come photons, in which way photons from this process or from this electron accelerated here, you have an energy close to the dark matter mass. It's tricky, right? The same argument I'm just showing you for muons, you can use for taus. Okay? But it was the difference for taus, because taus, they decay much faster than muons. And taus decay hydronically, not via leptonic decay. So taus, as soon as they are produced, they instantly instantaneously decay into hadrons. And these hadrons produce effectively loss of gamma rays because hadrons decay into pions. Pi zero, the main decay of pi zero is two photons. So if I produce taus, taus is massive, right? So you will not produce 
it needs to decay still, but does not decay into leptons mostly, it decays into hadrons. So the amount of gamma rays I get is not just looking at these things as I just showing you, oh, okay, I had this one does not radiate more, but the, the decay mode is completely different. Okay? And okay, now you're gonna understand something really nice. So let's say my detector, I have a telescope, okay? I have a, the, a telescope in Natal, which is very sensitive, very, very sensitive to low, to low energy photons. For some reason, my detector is not very good at probing high energy photons. What I'm gonna do, I want to look good. So I'm gonna place a limit on the annihilation cross section into the channel that gives me lots of low energy photons. Okay? But my limit at, is for that channel, it's not the overall sigma v, it's for that particular channel. But people from the particle physics community, they don't know the details they don't, because the limits, you're going to see they have sigma v versus mass, and there's a limit. And there in the caption says 4 bb bar, 4 e plus e minus, 4 tau tau, tau plus tau minus, 4 mu plus mu minus. But it's about on sigma v. But isn't that, it's not the overall sigma v, it's for sigma v for that channel. In my model, I can have that channel can be irrelevant. Okay? Then you're going to see a limit for one, very strong. Let's say like this. Then you see a limit here. And then let's say telescope one does this. Four BB bar. And then telescope two does this. Four, I don't know, tau plus, let's say, e plus e minus. <laughs> what people will see? Wow, telescope two is much better. Why is much better? Uh, he, his bound is driven by low energy photons, and he picked that channel to look good. Because again, what they measure is flux. When they want to translate the flux into sigma v, there is some model dependence that goes in the middle. Okay? This limit is it's not fully model independent. It does depend on the model you chose, the final state you chose. So that's where the model dependence is. It's not like, oh, it's, uh, my model has a vector boson and the other has a scalar. It's not, it's not this kind of model dependence I'm talking about. I'm talking about the final state you picked. Okay? Because for indirect detection, it doesn't matter what happened, well, in principle. It doesn't matter what happened in the middle. The only thing that matters is what was produced in plus, in minus, mu plus, mu minus. What is the energy? That's what it matters. That's what we care about. The final state and the energy they had. Okay? Fine? So it was two, two particles like this. So as you notice, if I have two particles going to two particles, two dark matter going to plus mu plus mu minus, the energy of the muon is the dark matter mass. The energy of the other muon is the dark matter mass. But if I had something like this, let's say my model is something different. It's chi going to, see, I'm going to give an example. my model chi goes to another chi another chi yeah. chi chi bar meets each other produces uh, let's say uh, a fermion and a new fermion psi or scalar so this is one of the models where Carlos Iaguna, who was here, he presented these three Z3 models, where you have three dark particles always in each vertex. So there are models where you have dark, a more complex dark sector, where you don't have just pairs of dark matter particles, you have three. 
or maybe four and so on. So let's say I have three or this, this thing could be also chi here. I'm just thinking in general, psi. Then in this case, if the mass of chi is much, sorry, if m, look at this, if m psi is equal m chi, then the mass, what is the mass of the L? Hmm? What? Half, half of it. 0.5. No, I'm not talking about the electron. I'm just saying any Fermi. Instead of a model Fermi. Instead of a model. No, I'm not talking about particle physics here. I'm just saying, if I have two particles, m chi and m chi. Okay, half the mass of the dark matter. So, and then if m psi is equal to dark matter mass, what is the energy of this particle possess? Dark matter mass. Perfect. Now, if I assume that the m psi is much lighter than m chi. We don't know. It depends. It's like this term model case. I have dark matter, dark matter going to mu plus mu minus. Both of them are much lighter than the dark matter particle, right? But fine. But let's think of the other case. Look, and now you're going to see it. M psi is larger than M chi. I can't, this thing can still exist, right? M chi. This thing still exists, right? Because the initial state, I have... 2 m chi in the initial state, and then one something that's, you know, something m chi, and then the mass of this, the energy of the standard model particle is much smaller. And then how are you going to now use this the same way you computed, let's say this was a muon, just to assume, or an electron, or whatever standard model particle you have here. Now, how are you going to use it to compute the same way you did it here? Because the energy of this particle is not the dark matter mass, which is assumed in those codes. Besides the different telescopes, the spectrum have more photons in high energies and higher spectrum can also be interested for in statistics Bob. Yes, since there'll be significantly less background high energy. Yes, since the amount of speed. Perfect. Yeah, exactly, Mikhail. And this he's just pointed out that if you have photons at higher energies, is is harder for astrophysical source to produce high energy photons. Okay? That's known. We don't know astrophysical processes that produce very high energy photons. It's harder. There are, but there are fewer. So if I observe a high energy photon, then my background should be small. Then I have a better signal over background significance. See? Because I have more events from the signal, dark matter, than from the background. If I go to lower energies, there are several astrophysical sources that send low energy photons. Then if my signal lives in the low energy photons, okay, but it's harder for me to separate what's in the background compared to the signal. Okay? You just remember, everything is statistics. Okay, if let's say I observe a thousand events from background. I expect a thousand events from background. But I measured 1,010. This thing comes from dark matter? Well, it depends. What's your error bar in the background of photons that you imagine, that you expect? Is that 1,000 plus minus 10? If it is, then what are you going to say? Okay? So obviously, you have to do a statistical analysis to, to do this. Mm -hmm. 
yeah let's say let's give an example so this is clear let's say this the same way i did this one is m chi is equal one tv m chi bar is one tv and then i'm gonna say that m psi is 1.5 tv then the energy the other is 0.5 which is which is very is half of what was was one third of the dark matter mass. So it's not equal to dark matter mass. It's one third. Yeah, could it just yes? Then the amount of photons you're gonna get for that small particle would be let's say roughly is not roughly one third of what you expect. So your bound would be one third weaker than you you would assume. Okay, it's not because the shape changes, it's not just a number and so on. So normal a normal chi a chi bar, cinema, cinema. It's just a rough estimate. Okay, any further comments and questions? I mean, I'm still thinking that Micromegas includes electric corrections. I'm, I am really surprised. Okay. Let's go into something else. Ah, so in this this uh, PPC DM, they also included this process here, which is called secluded. So friends, for everybody here, I guess they know Clarissa. So that was her proposal for uh, her postdoc to probe secluded dark sectors. So in this case, for this code, they had EE, mu mu and tau tau. And we did also for BV bar. So we included, we did it using PTA instead of using PPC. So let me discuss what this is. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Secular dark matter. So you first to the following. So you have a dark matter particle meets another one. They annihilate, but instead of producing standard model particles, they produced, let's say a vector in that case was another vector. And those vectors then they decay into, in their case was E plus, E minus, and this one goes into E plus, E minus. So you had what he mentioned there was Chi Chi producing 4E. That's what was written there. Or Chi Chi bar producing 4 muons. Or Chi Chi bar producing 4 tau's. Okay? That's the scenario they included. So that's called secluded. Secluded means because those particles are not, they do not belong to the certain amount of spectrum. There are vectors such as Z prime or a new boson, new scalar, whatever. Okay? Okay? Make sense? All right. So, however, we showed that uh, we, in a paper with Clarissa and Joseph Silk, that the this excluded channel, including PPC, that is something that's not considered which is the case where when the mass of the, this process happens at the resonance. Let's say that if in PPC, they assumed, is there, is written, that MV is much lighter than M chi. Is there in the code, P, P, C, I, D, M. That's what they assumed. However, for the models that we have in particle physics, actually this process is relevant when the dark matter mass is close to MV. Okay? I even discussed this process with Alvaro yesterday about some other things. So it means this, let's say I have M chi here, one TV, then meets another M chi bar, one TV, and then I have chi chi here, chi chi bar, and then, let's say, if it's a Fermi, then I, the, the Feynman diagram I have is this one. Hold on, let me erase. 
what I have is chi, chi bar, vector, vector. That's the Feynman diagram. And this process is only relevant when m chi is equal or larger than mv. Otherwise, this will never happen, right? <clears throat> so when m chi is roughly the same, close to this thing, there is a threshold effect which enhances the annihilation cross-section. And then this sigma v becomes large. So what we did was to show that when you are near the residence, this code from PPC gets wrong results. But it's not included in the code. So the change is not a factor of 10, but could be a factor of 6 or so. So, but still significant. Then, then you have to, to do so, we, you need to run using Pythia. So Pythia does account for resonance. So Luca or, and, or Mikael, who are using this continuously, you might tell me if Micromegas, the new version, does include resonance effects. So I don't know. If they use PPC IDM as input, then it doesn't. Okay? It includes resonance effects. I'm not sure about. Okay. All right. So let me go back to the, to the material. And now we're going to discuss something else. Ah, here it is. They also mention some differences regarding the Higgs. They assume that the when whenever there is a Higgs, they assume the Higgs is just a standard model Higgs. OK, so why I'm saying this? Because it goes again to what I was saying, was saying before. They assume standard model physics. Well, but in a given particle physics model, you know that you can have more than one Higgs. You can have several Higgs, many scalars, and that will change even scalars which are lighter than the Higgs boson. And in this case, the energy spectrum will also be changed. Okay? So again, you have to include, the same way they include for vectors, that could also have scalars, and they would change the energy spectrum. So when you when collaboration just quote sigma v versus mass, okay, in your model you can compare with the results, but it's not really trustworthy because your model is completely different from the scenario they considered. Okay, and that's why my let's say my goal uh, within CTA is exactly to perform these calculations for uh, having in mind the new physics. Okay, I have no intent of becoming experts on the astrophysics parts as some of you guys do. Okay, okay, hold on. Okay, and now I want to discuss this final state radiation and the electric spectrum, electric correction. Let me share with you this plot here. Okay, this one from Gamma Lines. So look at this one. This idea is quite nice. It's quite neat. Uh, so extending the Fermi Latin has limits. So now I'm going to show you something. Let me draw a Feynman diagram. I'm going to share that that uh, reference with you. Hold on. Okay. Fine. Okay, let's discuss electro week. Correction. So look at this. How it goes. So let's discuss that scenario I discussed before. So let me first point out that Fermi, Fermi lat, Fermi lat, 
telescope can probe gamma ray lines. Okay, so gamma rays that are a given energy up to, if I remember correctly, up to, let's say, 500 GV. So let's put it here, energy of the photon. And this one will be 500 GV. And from and photons from 500 MeV. So I can detect photons from 500 MeV to 500 GV, okay? Then notice this. If I have chi, chi bar producing E plus E minus, producing gamma ray lines, Okay, two photons. The energy of the photon is the dark matter mass. But it means is I can only probe using gamma ray lines, just a photon, dark matter mass is up to 500 GV. Right? Because the maximum the energy photon they can have is the dark matter mass. And then I can probe up to dark matter mass of 500 GV, which is true for gamma ray lines. Now, let me think of the following. If the dark matter particle mass is not 500, it's 700 GV. So m chi equals 700 GV. m chi bar is equal 700 GV. And they annihilate. And when they annihilate, they produce photons. I say, hey, for now, the photon, the energy of this photon is 700 GV. Fermi light cannot probe the dark matter particle. That's not necessarily true. And why is that? Because you have this photon. This photon could be a virtual particle and produce pairs of gamma plus or W plus, W minus, and pairs of W plus, W minus. And this W boson then, then decay into hadrons through the charge current. These hadrons hadronize, produce pions. These pions decay into photons. Then if I have, to look at this, the process that I'm actually, this thing is, this thing here is just a model, right? I know the vertex, which is proportional to the charge of the W. Photon does couples to fermions proportionally to their charge. So this is the model physics. So we see in textbook. And the only thing new, I'm assuming, is chi chi to gamma gamma. In other words, if I know this factor, if I somehow know this factor from the standard model, I can, and I measure, I know how many gamma rays will be produced from hydronization. I just use PTA or PPC IDM. I can use it for electrode corrections. Then I can count the amount of photons compared to the amount of photons observed and place a limit on sigma v for gamma gamma. So even if dark matter mass has 700 GV mass, annihilating to gamma gamma only, only. I'm not making any other assumption. Okay, but if there is a gamma, that gamma, if it has energy larger than twice the mass of the W boson, you produce W plus W minus. Okay? I can't have this anyways. Therefore, I can have, as he has, right? I mean, Kai has 700 GV. Therefore, and these Ws will decay into hadrons, hadrons will hadronize and produce gamma. But the gammas they produce are belong to the continuum, not the block, not just a line. But I can correlate the continuum to the line because I know what that came really from a line. It was gamma chi chi going to gamma gamma. And as long as those photons fall into this box of 500 MeV, 500 GV, I can probe it. Therefore, I can probe dark matter masses which whose masses are larger than, 7, than 500 GV as long as I take into account electric correction. So electric correction serves as a way to extend the sensitivity of current gamma ray telescopes. Okay, and that has never been done, so please don't steal my idea. <laughs> that has never been done for CTA. Okay, it has never been done. That's actually one of the projects that I had for Leticia. 
has been done for Fermilab and has, has already has been done, but not for CTA. Well, we don't have data from CTA, so. Um, yeah, so the, 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 as you see, the process is smaller, right? Because I haven't taken into account these other processes. So I'll get a suppression, but it's still, I'll have a limit on sigma V for dark matter mass above 500 GB. So the bound that gets weaker because I have to include all these other factors and so on. Yeah, it will be low is impossible. Mm -hmm. Because, well, the, think of the following. The, the, what, dark, what a telescope probes is not the range of the dark matter mass. It has nothing to do with dark matter mass. What it probes is the energy of the photon. The energy of the photon. What is the dark matter mass? Then depends on your model. What the telescope says, look, I see photons have 500 MeV to 500 GV. As long as your model, whatever it is, I don't care, produces me a photon within that range, I can probe it. What is a line that produced doubles, whatever, whether it was neutrinos that produced whatever, I don't care. You, I can probe it. As long as it produces a photon within that range has nothing to do with dark matter mass. So this limit here is misleading in this way, this one. It appears that the telescope can only probe masses from here to here. This is not true. This is true for that channel, E plus, E minus, B, B bar, and for other channels can go to higher masses, lower masses, depends on your model. So that doesn't mean that it only probes that mass. Yes, for that channel. Okay? Any questions? For every what? It's too much work. So what we did in this paper that I'm going to show you now, uh, so we did this one, so here. So we did for Fermilat and Haas, as you see here, the limits gets really weak. Here. So if you had dark matter annihilating to gamma gamma, those are the limits. So for instance, this one's from Fermilat. Look at this. So Fermilat can prove up to here, one, two, three, four, like almost five, 500 GB. See here? That's the point. I, I, I think you can see my cursor, yes. But now I can place limits all the way to 10 TV now. But the limits are orders of magnitude smaller. And this has to do with the whole, whole uh, the phase space suppression I have for having more particles in the finite state. OK? Because remember, the more particles I have in the finite state, the smaller my cross section. Anyway, any, this for has, look at this, has. So has limits it stops at 10 to 20 TV. That's the original collaboration paper from has. That's their limit. Their limit is right there. We just took the data from their plots and placed here. And now you can probe for masses up to 500 TV. And they are the best limits in the literature for gamma gamma and gamma Z using has data. I'm just take into account these, let's say, not loop effects, but other chains reactions from gamma gamma. So it's a way to extend the limits to higher energies. And they say, oh, Fernando, why is this relevant? Because they are telescopes. They are built to probe dark matter. They're, well, they have a whole paper saying, look, we placed a limit on dark matter annihilation cross-section, which is much better than has. 
above 20 TV. Well, there is no limit from has above 20 TV. There has stops at 20 TV mass. And then they place a the limit and the limit is around the one I just showed you here. This is one in green and in red and blue. And our point is, look, you didn't need to do, you didn't, you didn't need a telescope to have a limit around there because I can just use the has limit and standard model of physics to get the limit in the first place. I would not need to run a whole telescope there just to cover masses above 20 TV. There are telescopes such as called Hawk and Veritas are telescopes which can probe dark matter masses above 20 TV or energy of photons above 20 TV. But we can already do this using has data, just taking into account this electronic corrections. I don't need to have a detector with sensitive to energies larger than 20 TV because just using the amount of physics, I can do that. Okay? But obviously, it's more robust because they did the detector, perform it, didn't see anything. It's way more robust than me just doing electronic corrections and, and, and getting the bound. They really had a detector and they didn't see anything. So that limit's way more robust than ours, right? Okay, any further questions? Okay, so now let me cover another one, which is, let me see if I, which one I'll go first. So let me, right hand the screen, okay. in your physics. Beyond dark matter. So let's just say now I have a model where you have Kai Kai bar, annihilate, and for some reason, produ sorry, produces right-handed neutrinos. NR, NR. So why I'm talking about this? Well, I know those who are not very familiar with particle physics, but white-handed neutrinos are very popular extensions of the center model where when you try to explain neutrino masses, okay? And in many, many, many of those models, which also have dark matter, this annihilation to right-handed neutrinos is present. So you do have annihilation to right-handed neutrinos. But then these right-handed neutrinos, they decay into something like this, into an electron and a W boson. And this decay, this W boson then decays into UD or whatever, E neutrino, whether it's hadronic or leptonic decay. What I'm trying to say with this is that no someone is entering and leaving the the, the meeting mm -hmm. Okay, and then you just flip the, the, the charges of the final state. So what I'm trying to say is the following. So using, and these things were produced gamma rays. What I'm trying to say is there is a lack in the community that interplay, uses the interplay between particle physics and astrophysics. So there are excellent people doing this part of collecting gamma ray data. It's a very hard work comparing getting the J factor right, which is, has to do with the integral of the rho density profile of dark matter. They are very good at this. But there is a lack of people working on trying to do, explore the interplay between that analysis and new physics in particle physics. So in this case here is a, is a clear example where you have 
right-handed twins, which are well motivated in particle physics, it has nothing to do with astronomy or astrophysics, but they do have an impact on astrophysics or gamma ray searches, because if dark matter happens to annihilate into right-handed neutrinos, then the decay mode or the annihilation, the gamma ray spectra you observe is distinct from the other uh, energy spectrum you, you would expect from uh, canonical dark matter annihilation processes. Then what I'm trying to say at the end of the day is that once you place a limit on the energy flux of gamma rays, using the gamma rays produced from dark matter annihilations into neutrinos, you can use that information to place a limit on both the dark matter mass and the right-handed neutrino mass using gamma ray data. So, and we, and there are gamma ray, right handed neutrinos. If you just Google it, right hand neutrinos, colliders, you're going to see a bunch of data from on right hand neutrinos. If you write down right, uh, right hand neutrinos or called sterile neutrinos, they mean the same thing. Sterile neutrinos, X ray data, you're going to see lots of people searching for sterile neutrinos, which means right hand neutrinos, using X ray data. But if you search, Google it, right hand neutrinos, gamma ray data, you basically are going to see like two papers only. So for some reason, the gamma ray community is not really interested. In, uh, perhaps they didn't notice the importance of placing limits on right hand neutrinos because they are very, very popular candidates in new physics studies. So, and there are many others. So for instance, there we have in, in models where you try to explain neutrino masses, you have charge scalars, you have doubly charged scalars for those who work on seesaw models. They know this, but I have never seen in my entire life a search for gamma rays using connections with seesaw mechanism. Never seen it, never. And if you search, if you Google on Inspires, for instance, put Inspires, Dark Matter, the title, find title, Dark Matter and Neutrino, you're going to see how many papers were written just this year exploring this. But it has nothing to do with gamma ray searches, just collider, physics, nuclear studies, blah, 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 blah. But the astro community should be involved in that and get attention for this because there would be the first results on, on exploring neutrinos and dark matter, which are including additionally to Brayton symmetry, the matter antimatter symmetry, the, the main reasons to go beyond the standard model. So why not, we should not use neutrino phases in dark matter to, uh, in the context of gamma ray studies. I think that's is something that we must do. You know. Okay, so this that's what I had to say for today. It's one hour and 20. Uh, are there any other questions? No? OK, Luca, my name. Not for me? OK. All right. Okay, so wait. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Kijama? Kijama looks like a, 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 I know, a soap opera author, <laughs> actor, soap opera actor in, in this photo, Kijama. Uh, the guy, the new guy from from global soap opera, <laughs> really fancy. Okay, so okay, 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 guys, I'm gonna finish, and see you guys on Monday at 10 a.m. All right. So I think we're gonna discuss. Uh, I think to end at least this complementary dark, dark matter complementarity, which is where we wrap up all the information we have gathered for the in the past lectures. Okay. All right. Bye and have a nice weekend.